Sabbe satta bhavantu sukitatta bhavantu sukitatta Hello, I'm Dharmasar. And today I'd like to talk about the Buddha's teachings about rebirth. Now the way that sounds, it seems like rebirth is part of the Buddha's teaching. And certainly in one sense it is. But in another sense, rebirth is the context of the Buddha's teaching. In other words, rebirth is the problem the Buddha's teaching is designed to solve. Think about that for a minute. It's very significant because context determines meaning. If you've gone through our course on matrix learning, which I'm going to link to here, then you have encountered this idea before, that context determines meaning. And just to illustrate it, I'm going to put a short selection up on the screen for you to read. Now, did that make sense? Well, sort of, but not really. Now, here's the same selection again, put in context. Is that better? I thought so. So similarly, the Buddha's teaching, when put in the context of a solution for the problem of death, and rebirth looks a whole lot different from the Buddha's teaching in the context of self-actualization or uh, California mindfuck uh, exercises or uh, self-improvement, self-help, that kind of thing, pop psychology and so on. So the problem is, in the West, and even now to a great extent in the East, the Buddha's teaching is being adapted to a context that it was never intended to be in, which gives it a meaning it was never intended to have. And some people will say, so what? The Buddha's teaching is extensible and adaptable to different cultures and different mindsets and so on, and, and that's true to a certain extent. But the Buddha's teaching, without the concepts of karma and rebirth, is sort of like a car without an engine. A car without an engine it has everything, steering wheel, seats, headlights, controls, I mean, even the radio might work until the battery runs down. But without an engine, that car isn't going anyplace. So, similarly, without the teachings on karma and rebirth, and specifically dependent origination, the Buddha's teaching is disempowered. It doesn't have an engine. It doesn't go anyplace. It doesn't arrive anywhere. It doesn't take you somewhere where you want to go. And that's a big problem. And we see in the West today, nobody's becoming enlightened. In fact, even in the East. But that's due to a different problem. That's due to Buddhism being taken as a religion. But both of these problems uh, go back to the Protestant Reformation of Buddhism that took place in the late 1800s and early 1900s under the influence of British Protestant uh, religion. Uh, everything had to be thrown out of Buddhism that, that wasn't acceptable to the colonials. Otherwise, Buddhism would have been probably ruthlessly suppressed, violently suppressed. So, Buddhism is such a threat to the Western mindset 
that it has to be suppressed. And especially Western culture is ruthless in suppressing any thoughts that might attack or change its ontological basis. I have experience of this on a personal level. Some years ago, I taught some Tantra methods to a couple of consenting adults, students of mine, yes, but they were volunteers and they knew exactly what they were getting into beforehand. And uh, now, as a result, anytime I try to teach on a, a Buddhist forum, the uh, blowback or the suppression is tremendous. Uh, black propaganda, lies, deceit, any trick in the book. What happened to the Buddhist principles of truthfulness and avoiding harsh speech? Well, apparently when dealing with people who are outside of your context, those rules don't apply. The nicey-nicey Western Buddhist lefty liberal morality apparently doesn't apply to anyone who's outside or viewed as outside their context. Similarly, Whenever Western culture takes over, as it has nearly everywhere now, any beliefs or practices that don't fit in with the nicey-nicey leftish liberal morality, or what to speak of, fundamentalist Christian morality, are simply done away with, ignored, or criticized out of existence. And this has happened to rebirth. Now, rebirth is different from reincarnation. And I'm not going to insult your intelligence by giving you a tutorial on this subject. You can go look it up. Uh, there are many good sources of information on the web, starting with Wikipedia, that give information on this topic. And I would encourage you to take a look at that. So, what is the problem, really? Well, the problem is people are not becoming enlightened. They're not getting the ultimate and most powerful benefits that the Buddha's teaching was designed to give. The problems of life go on a sliding scale huh, from trivial to extreme. And a trivial problem is, how do I reduce my anxiety? Or how do I stop worrying? Uh, how do I overcome negative self-image, or how can I clean up my thoughts and focus so that I can be more productive? <laughs> These are trivial problems. You can find many, many solutions outside of the Buddha's teaching that work just fine. So why should we go to mindfulness classes and all of this just to become more productive in the workplace and make our boss richer, faster? <laughs> it's just a bad deal. But there's no need to go to the Buddha's teaching for these things. They already exist in other contexts that are not designed to solve the really big problems, the extreme problems of life. And the most extreme problem I can conceive of is a problem that goes outside of life, that goes in other words, from existence to non-existence. In other words, death. How do we solve the problem of death? Well, of course, the Buddha's teaching contains many methods for dealing with death, beginning with mindfulness of death and going all the way through the non-material jhanas, or meditations on unlimited space, unlimited consciousness, nothingness, or neither perception nor non-perception, which, of course, is the precursors for Nibbana. But if you can realize Nibbana, you become free from the compulsion to take birth. Let that sink in for a minute. What happens when people die? Let's go through this in a little detail. 
Well, you've heard the expression, at the time of death, your whole life flashes before your eyes. And what is this? Well, it's kind of like when you get to the end of a tape and hit rewind. Huh? The whole contents of the tape go by, flash by, in a few seconds. And it sounds like garbled, unless you're an audio engineer, and once your, engine, your ears get used to it, you can actually locate different events in the tape based on what you hear during the rewind. Any audio engineer worth his salt can do this, especially from my era, <laughs> when we actually used tape recorders. Um, but what's going on here is that the contents of the mind are being compressed, archived, into a seed. And that seed is the uh, beginning, actually, of the next life, the next cycle of becoming an action. So, in other words, the results of the actions, thoughts, and words of this life are compressed in such a way that not so much the content but the quality is preserved. And that quality becomes the basis of the next life, the next cycle of becoming, the next embodiment, the next existence. So then what happens? Okay, the body is failing, the mind is failing, you go off into, well, basically, the non-material jhanas. Nothingness, emptiness, non-existence, space, unlimited space, unlimited time, unlimited consciousness, at least potentially. But what happens with most people is that they say they're attached to their body and I, I want my body back. Huh? I want to have body and senses and mind and all these things that I'm used to having. And so because of these desires and because they're in a very high place, they actually begin another new cycle of being and becoming. And this is how rebirth takes place. Don't believe it? Well, consider this. Even in this life, we've gone from being an infant, to a baby, to a toddler, to a small child, to a young rascal, <laughs> to a slightly bigger rascal called adolescent, and then a mature rascal, <laughs> an adult. But what happened to the likes and dislikes, the activities and words, the feelings that we had when we were an infant? Most of us can't remember them. But they're vastly different from our adult thoughts and desires and experiences. Why? Because we have changed the body. Because we have gone through a process of becoming. So the process of becoming, the process of rebirth, is going on in this very life. And what happens at death, and consequent rebirth, usually, is simply an extension of the same process. Now this process is described in detail by the Buddha in his teaching of Paticca Samuppada, or dependent origination, dependent arising, and so many other names in English. But basically, this is the action of the law of karma, kamma in Pali. And what kamma says is, when this is, that is. When this disappears, that also ceases. In other words, causality. So because of this law of causality, cause and effect, we have a process which is given by the Buddha, and we've gone through it in many of our videos. I'm not going to go through it in detail again. I'm trying to get the overview. So the point is, if we're going to, let's say, become enlightened, or even in a mundane example, let's say we're going to become a better meditator, or we're going to become 
free from anxiety, or whatever it is we want from the Buddha's teaching. There has to be a process of becoming. There has to be a process of dependent origination, cause and effect. But we do this all the time. Going to school, for example, getting a degree in something or other, is a process of becoming. We want to become a professional in whatever field we're interested in. We want to become competent at certain skills, certain knowledge. So we go to school. And what is school about? Name and form. Consciousness. Huh? Sense contact. Feelings. So on. All of the elements of Paticca Samuppada. So this same process of becoming, cause and effect, is going on in this same life, this very same uh, existence, without changing the body. So when we change the body, of course the same process is going to be there. But more serious, more enhanced, more powerful, because we're dealing with the end of one body, the end of one mind, the end of one identity, and the creation of another. So, to come back to the central point again, without this process of becoming, without this law of karma, of dependent origination, without this uh, idea of death and rebirth, even within the same life, the Buddha's teaching makes little sense it has little significance and it has very, very little value compared to the original conception which includes karma and rebirth. So throwing out the ideas of karma and rebirth just because you don't like them on a metaphysical level or philosophical level doesn't do you any good. In fact, it cuts you off from the principal benefits of the Buddha's teaching just like having a car with no engine cuts you off from the principal benefits of owning a car, which is to be able to go anywhere you want. So similarly, the Buddha's teaching in its entirety allows us the freedom to enter and leave different embodiments, different states of being at will, without compulsion, without being forced by our karma. This is a tremendous freedom. And the ability to exercise this freedom is known as the mind-made body in the Buddhist teaching. So I'm not going to bore you by tedious repetition of what is already in so many other places on the internet. <laughs> you can look these things up for yourself. And I have realized all these things by my own meditation. So it's up to you to do the same. It's up to you to realize the Buddha's teaching for yourself and develop a vehicle that can take you anywhere you want to go. Sabbe satta bhavantu sukhitatta bhavantu sukhitatta